Okay, I'm so glad that you all are all here this morning because you guys were a rowdy crowd last night. Today I have the pleasure of introducing our keynote speaker, Ricardo Palomares. Ricardo is a world explorer and multimedia storyteller who began a project in 2014 called Pedal South. This entailed leading a crew as the producer co-director, riding bicycles for 21 straight months from Alaska to Argentina to make a feature-length documentary. A Mexico City native, Ricardo immigrated to the United States after graduating from photography school with the singular focus of building a career that would allow him to explore the world. Ricardo earned a radio television film degree from the University of Texas at Austin. Ricardo then went on to create a documentary content for Live Strong Foundation in Mexico and China and made the famous pilgrimage Camino de Santiago in Spain and served as the director of photography for a wide range of commercials, shorts, and feature films. Ricardo approaches every new day, project, and journey with curiosity, an unshakable work ethic, humility, and a sense of humor. And I'm sure some of you met him last night. He's just a really great guy. So you guys give a HEB welcome to Ricardo Palomares. Good morning. How is everybody doing? I just want to start by saying that I'm really, I spent the last couple of days with you guys and talking to each one of you, and I'm really, I'm really inspired of how each one of you and HEV as a company is really devoted to service. Each one of you that I talk to is always telling me how much they enjoy working with HEV and how much they enjoy serving people. And so today my goal is to serve you by sharing my story and some of the things that I learned along the way to hopefully uh, make you a better leader. Because I believe that each one of us leads in an area of our lives. You either lead at home, at your work, with your friendships or relationships. But even if you don't lead in any of those areas, you lead yourself every single day. I think you lead yourself with your thoughts, with your words, and your, in your actions. So I hope today that by sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way, you can become a better leader. Yeah, at home, at work, friendships, relationships, but more, better than that, I want you to become a better leader to yourself. So in June 11, 2014, my friends and I flew to Alaska, and our goal was to cycle from Alaska to Argentina over the course of 21 months. To cycle from the top of the world to the bottom of the world. 14,000 miles through 14 countries. And every single day during that journey, it was ingrained in my heart and my mind that life is not about the destination, but about the journey. That if point A is, Ar is Alaska and point B is Argentina, it was never about point B. It was never about Argentina. It was always about that space in the middle where we got to see the most incredible landscapes. We got to meet the most magnificent people. And we got to push ourselves mentally, physically, and spiritually on a daily basis. So today I have two goals. One, I want to encourage you to make your life about the journey. And second, I want to share with you one really massive, profound advice that helped me endure the 21 months while feeling happy and content. But before I share that advice, I want to tell you the story of how I got the advice. I want to start by, you know, make your life about the journey. So that's myself, when I was a kid. <laughs> so I was born and raised in Mexico City. My name is Ricardo Palomares. And as long as I can remember, my dream has been to travel around the world. There's some massive, really deep need that I have of seeing what is out there. And because of that, I made my dream to travel around the world doing what I love, helping people. Travel around the world, doing photography and video, sharing stories worth sharing, helping people. Because of that, I went to photography school. Because of that, I moved to the US, to San Antonio. 
and because of that, I went to UT. And now I remember the first day that I went to UT, and I was terrified. I was so terrified because the campus is massive. And I didn't think that I was going to be able to walk from classroom to classroom. Because when I was a kid, I had two major accidents that kind of affected the rest of my life. One, I was in a really bad car accident. And second, I, was, I had a really bad groin injury. And because I grew up really poor in Mexico, we didn't have money to pay for utilities or food sometimes. We couldn't go to the doctor. And so the, both of them affected me over time. The car accident affected my, my neck and then started affecting my back, and I started getting pinched nerves in my back. The groin injury started affecting the way I walk and started affecting my knees and my ankles. And so till this day, every single step that I take, I have to think about it. Every single one of them, I have to focus that I make the right step. And until this day, I get really tired if I take too long. Till this day, I get really tired if I walk for too long. So to me, walking across campus was ridiculous. I, couldn't, I didn't think I was going to be able to do it. And so I, I signed into, I, I get accepted to UT, and I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to start classes a year later. And for the next couple months, I keep feeling, feeling sorry about myself because I don't think I'm going to be able to walk across campus. I don't do anything about it. I just feel like this is stupid. How stupid it is that my goal is just to walk. But then I realized that I needed to accept that that was my starting point. That was the starting of my journey. As small as it was, that, that's what it is. I have to accept where my journey starts. So what I do is I buy this vest. I buy this vest that I put up to 40 pounds of weight, and I start doing squats every single day. And I start running with this vest. And I do that every single day for the next year. And by the time I start at UT, I'm walking across campus. <laughs> so what I learned about that is that it doesn't matter how big, it doesn't matter how small or stupid or dumb you think your goal is. If you don't accept that that's where your starting point, you're not going to get anywhere. Because if you don't accept that that's where your starting point, you're not, you're not even going to fight. I do really well at school. I get scholarships. And then eight months before I graduate, a girl comes to my class and says, I'm part of a program that takes students around the world to create content to promote other nonprofits. We take students around the world, creating photography and video, sharing stories worth sharing, helping people. And I just thought that somebody had just grabbed my dream and made it into a program. Right away, I sign in. And I, I get accepted, and I realize that the program's in the summer, and I'm supposed to graduate in the summer. So then I have to figure out how to, how to graduate and how do I can be a part of the program. I sit down, and I see, and I write a, leery, a really intricate map of how, like, how, am I, how am I going to be able to do both. What I decide is that I'm going to have to take 21 hours next semester, which is not a lot, but... And because of that, I'm not going to be able to work because I'm going to be so busy at school. And because I'm not going to be able to work, I'm going to go broke. And because I'm not going to be able to, I mean, because I'm going to go broke, I'm going to go homeless. So then I ask myself, are you willing to go broke and homeless to pursue your dream? Yeah. So every single day after that, when I just work as hard as I can at school, I give up friends, I give up sleep for a while. Six months later, later I graduate, and I finally get to travel. And I go to Mexico and China to do content for Livestrong to try to erase stigmas that cancer has. Stigmas like cancer is contagious, cancer does not have a cure, cancer is a punishment from God. And it's so beautiful, but it's really heavy too, because it's so emotional content. I get back, we edit the project, and it's successful. And what I learned about that was that you need to be really clear what is your goal. You need to be really aware of your sacrifices, and you have to accept the consequences. Because if you're not aware of the consequences of your goal, then every time you go forward and there's an obstacle standing in front of you, you're going to hesitate because you don't know if you're willing to go through it. But if you accept the, the consequences beforehand, then everything is just paperwork. There's no doubt, there's no hesitation, there's only action. Like I said, I knew I was going to go broke and homeless, so I am broke and homeless. I'm sleeping in a friend's house. But because I pushed myself so hard and I didn't take, my care, I didn't take care of myself for so long, that my gallbladder gives out, and I have to have surgery. 
And on top of that, a week later, I got a pinch nerve on my back. So then I'm broke, homeless, sleeping in a friend's house. I'm recovering from surgery, and I can barely walk. And I tell myself, you, need, you really need to take a break. You need to take some time for yourself. So I start thinking, you know, I'm going to go to maybe Canada, maybe South America to take a break. But then I suddenly I remember of a book that I read a long time about, ago about a pilgrimage, a pilgrimage in Spain called Camino de Santiago, where you have to walk from border to see the entire country of Spain. And right there, I decided that I was going to walk Spain. Now, I didn't know, I don't know why I thought I was going to be able to do it, because I could barely walk. I didn't know, I don't know why, why I thought that was going to be able to heal me, but I did. So I sell all my stuff, I give away most of my clothes, and I fly to Spain. I fly to Spain, I ride to Madrid, take a train to Pamplona, and take a cab to France. It's a little town called St. John in the border. And I settle in in a shelter with all the pilgrims, and I put all my stuff on the floor. And it's my camera, my, my backpack, and everything that I'm going to need. I put everything together, and I put it in, and it's around 40 pounds, and reminded me of that time of the best. And I realized that <laughs> I didn't ever even consider how many miles am I supposed to walk. I have no idea how long, how far, how many days. And I look at the schedule, and the first day, the next day, I have to walk 17 miles across the Pyrenees. I have to walk 17 miles across the Pyrenees. And the next day after that, I have to walk another 17 miles. And the next day after that, I have to walk another 17 miles. So in average, I have to walk 17 miles a day for 40 days straight. And I'd really start wondering, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this. I go to sleep, I wake up, and I start the pilgrimage. I'm so excited about it because, hey, a couple of weeks ago, I couldn't even walk. I keep walking, and I'm excited, but I, soon enough, I really realize that I'm not ready to do this. A couple hours into the, into the hike, my knees start giving out. And I'm still wondering if I'm going to be able to finish the pilgrimage. After 10 hours, I get to the, to the destination. And I'm exhausted. I'm so tired. I wake up and I can barely open my eyes, and I have to do that again the next day. But the second day, the first step that I give is pain. It's just pressure. And that pressure keeps building and building and building. Half a day into it, the pressure turns into pain. And I do that for the next couple of hours, and I finally get to the destination the same. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this tomorrow. I wake up tomorrow. I can barely open my eyes, and I, do, I give the first step. The first step is pain. And that pain, after, after every single step after that one is pain and pain and pain. And then five hours into it, it's just really sharp pain. And at that point, I know that the pilgrimage is over. There's no way I can finish the pilgrimage. At that point, I'm just wondering if I'm going to finish the day. I get to the destination. I feel so defeated. I settle in, and then a pilgrim comes to me and says, hey, I saw you really struggled today. I have this 1,000 milligram pill of ibuprofen. I'm like, yeah, cool. Another guy comes and gives me some ice. Another guy comes and tells me, hey, I have this cream that is going to help you. I'll put it in. So I took the pill, I put some ice, and I put the cream. Another lady comes and tells me, hey, do you believe that I can heal you with your hands, with my hands? <laughs> I was like, sure. So I, so I kneel down, and she starts hovering her hands on top of my knees and starts praying something. Like, at the end of the day, like, seven people gave me seven different remedies. And I, felt, I went to bed feeling way better, at least emotionally, because that was so funny. I wake up, and the first step that I give, I don't feel pain. I feel the pressure. I give a couple steps, and I feel pressure for no pain. I do squats. I feel the pressure, but not pain. So I tell myself, OK, you're going to do this. Just continue the pilgrimage. But what you're going to do is that you're going to focus on yourself, not in the person ahead of you going faster than you, not in the person behind you going slower than you, not in the person next to you. You're going to focus on yourself, on your path, and taking it one step at a time. And when you can't make it anymore, you're going to take a break, stand back up, and do it again. And you're going to do that over and over and over again until you, you definitely can't do it anymore. I started the pilgrimage, and when I get tired and I'm with pains, I, I take a break. I stand back up, I keep doing it again, 
over and over again. And before I know it, I already hiked 14 miles a day. And then I look up, and there's a massive mountain in front of me. Because I didn't look at the schedule, and at the end of the day, it was supposed to be a massive mountain that we needed to hike. And at that point, I'm already there. So I keep doing it slowly, one step at a time. It starts getting steeper and steeper and steeper. It starts getting more painful, more painful, and more painful. When I can't take it anymore, I take a break. I stand back up, and I do it again. I do that for a couple hours, and I finally make it to the top, and it's incredible. I'm so proud of myself. And at that point, I'm just, I'm just going to sleep over there. But then when I start looking at the distance, I can see a little town, and that's the, t the town where I'm supposed to get to. And I said, yeah, you can do this. So I start going down again. But as soon as I go down the first step, I realize that, the fir that it's going to be way harder on my knees than going up. A couple steps in, it's just pain. A couple steps in, it's more pain. And before I know it, it's way more pain than I never felt before. And I start crying. Not because of the pain, because I'm so tired of feeling weak. I'm so tired of always feeling so defeated. And I start telling myself, I'm not weak. I'm not weak. I'm not weak. And I tell myself, you're strong. You're strong. And I give one step, and it hurts. You're strong. You're strong. And then I give another step. You're strong. And I keep crying more because it's way painful. And you're strong in more pain. You're strong. You're strong. And before I know it, I'm at the bottom of the mountain. And an hour later, I get to the destination. I walk 17 miles that day. And every single day after that one, I, get, I keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And before I knew it, I had walked the entire country of Spain from border to sea. And what I learned about that is that you need to focus on yourself, you need to focus on your path, and take it one step at a time. Don't focus on the person ahead of you, behind you, next to you. Focus on yourself, on your path, and take it one step at a time. When you can't take it anymore, take a break and do it again. And keep doing that till you walk farther than you thought it was possible. At that point, I definitely I heal physically and mentally, but I feel like I need some time to heal emotionally. So what I do is I go traveling around Europe for a while. I settle in in Wales. I settle in this little cabin in Wales because I want to spend some time by myself. I want to spend time alone. The best, way, the, the, the best way that I can describe it is what I told my mom. I called my mom and told her, hey, you're not going to hear from me for a while because for a little bit, I don't want to be a friend. I don't want to be a boyfriend. I don't want to be a son. I don't want to be a photographer. I don't want to be anything but myself. And she was like, wait, this is way over my head. I don't even know what you're talking about. But it, to me, it made sense, because how am I supposed to perform as a friend, boyfriend, photographer, son, if I don't take care of myself first, if I don't know who I am first? So what I do for two months I spend in this cabin is I meditate every day. I went to long walks in the forest, right there with those guys. I worked out as intense as I could. I read as much as I could. And I prayed a lot. And what I learned about that is that, that you need to love yourself for who you are. Yeah, you need to love yourself because you're a brother, a son, mom, dad, whatever. But first you need to love yourself just because you are yourself. And if you do that, all those relationships are going to improve. I come back. And as soon as I come back, I'm getting invited to a cycling trip. And so for the next year and a half, we have to plan for that trip. That's my team right there. <laughs> and six months before I have to leave for the trip, I get another pinch in my back. But this time, it's way worse. This time, I'm in so much pain that I can't even walk for weeks. And I'm in so much pain that I can't even sleep. And I know that a pinched nerve is not a big deal, but it is to me because that has been my Achilles heel for the last 10 years. And in my head, I thought I had done everything that I needed to do to get better. I sold my stuff, I gave away all the things. I went to Spain, I walked across Spain, I spent time in the mountains, and that was not enough. Not only that, I was worse than ever before. So I felt that something broke here. I felt that something broke here more than anything. I spent months and months and months feeling sorry about myself. 
I spent months telling me that I was weak. I spent months telling me that I was broken. And it got so bad that I ended up calling my mom, telling her that I couldn't take it, that I needed her help. So what she did was she came live with me for a little bit. And a couple of weeks into it, she told me, Ricardo, I've never seen you like this before. It's, it's like you gave up. But yeah, I definitely did give up. Because in the past, whenever I was beaten down, at least I knew there was a way out. In the past, when I was beaten down, at least I knew I had the faith and the energy to get out. But this time, I didn't know the way or the faith or the energy to get out. Time passes by. I, I don't have pain anymore, but I'm still broken mentally. And my mom comes and says, Ricardo, my son is not a coward. So you're not going to tell me that a stupid back pain is going to break you down. Something just flipped in my head. Because at that moment, I stopped focusing on how broken I was and started focusing on my dream. I started reminding myself that my goal was to travel the world to help people. I stopped focusing that I, that I was so broken and I started focusing on creating. I learned that you need to focus on your strengths, not on your weaknesses. You need to focus on your goals, not on your obstacles. If you feel weak, make yourself feel strong. Focus on creating a path, not the fact that you can't find a path. I keep getting better and better and better. My mom starts worrying because she doesn't think that I'm ready enough to do the trip. I, I don't pay attention, I keep better and better and better until I, it's time to go to, to go to the trip and I'm ready to go. We fly to Alaska and we get to Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, which is the northern tip of the, of the world. And then from Prudhoe Bay to Fairbanks is 500 miles. And those 500 miles takes around two weeks to a cyclist to do it. It's the Dalton Highway. In the Dalton Highway, there's nothing but gravel and mud. There's no food, no people, no houses or buildings. So you, what you have to do is you have to prepare for two weeks' worth of food. And so you have to prepare. We had stacks and stacks and stacks of ramen, and we had bread to do PB&J sandwiches. A couple of days into the trip, we run out of gas. So now we're stuck in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, with nothing to eat but dried ramen and two PB&J sandwiches a day. And, to, and just to give you a perspective, a week before, we were in Austin, sleeping in a bed, exercising maybe 30 minutes a day, and eating healthy and sufficient food. A week later, we're in the middle of nowhere, Alaska, cycling eight to 10 hour days, eating nothing but dry ramen and two PB&J sandwiches a day. And on top of that, it's the summer in Alaska, so it's 24 hours of daylight. The sun does not set for weeks and weeks and weeks. So what happens is that you cycle and the sun looks like 2 p.m. You cycle 10 hours and it looks the same. You go to bed, wake up and it looks the same. Cycle another 10 hours and it looks the same. So everything is just like a really, really long dream. So we're exhausted, we're hungry, we're really angry, and this dream is never gonna end. After a couple of days of that, we see a sign that says, Happy Valley Camp. We see a building, we rush into a building, we open the door and there's a, there's a kitchen and there's a lady. There's Marcy. And we ask Marcy, could you please feed us? Could you please give us some food? We've been starving for the last couple of days. She feed us, she gives us, give us some drinks. But there's something about her that really catches my attention. There's something about her that is really different. And that was that she seemed really happy. She seemed so content. And I know that in my life I haven't met too many people that live that look happy with today. That I don't, know, I don't know too many people that are content with their life today. And I know for me, it's always a step ahead. I always feel like happiness is gonna be once I accomplish something, once I get something. So I go to her and I ask her, this is my problem, it seems that you have the solution to my problem, would you mind telling me what it is? She looks at me and smiles, and says, you need to learn to love the pain. You need to learn to love the ugly. 
You need to learn to love the pain because that is where your love is needed the most. So for the next 21 months, every single day that I was hungry, that I was cold, that I almost had a mental breakdown, I told myself that I needed to learn to love that moment. Why? Because my love was needed there. Because from within pain, there's a potential for growth. Within pain, there's the potential for change. Within pain, there's a potential for compassion. Within pain, there's a potential for self-discovery. And knowing yourself and conquering yourself is the biggest battle you can win in your life. I don't, it's really hard to describe how hard that trip was. It was incredible highs, incredible lows. And I felt like mentally, physically, and spiritually, I was ripped apart and built back up. Like the time, like, that's Alaska in the middle of nowhere. The time we almost got attacked by a bear and they was eating our food right there. <laughs> we were in Mexico filming the wells. Guatemala on top of the mountains. San Blas Islands in Panama. Sleeping, <laughs> pretty much. Oh, this is a shaman cleaning our bad energies. And by the way, she told that I had the cleanest energy out of all of us. <laughs> Ecuador. Swimming with giant turtles in Costa Rica. Sleeping in the dirt. Now, this is a water park in the middle of the desert in Peru. So we're cycling in the desert, <laughs> and we see a water park, and we stop, and there's no one but the people that work in the water park. And our first reaction without hesitating is like, should we get naked? Like, yeah. So that guy, <laughs> that guy is, I had to put extra water in that photo because he was naked. <laughs> That's Machu Picchu. He said, Sandstorm in Peru. Waterfall in Chile. It's my birthday in Patagonia, so they made a piñata for me in the middle of the mountains. A glacier in Patagonia. A lake in Chile. Cycling in the Andes. And we finally get to Argentina. And we got to Argentina with Patagonia. And Patagonia is at the bottom of the world. And half of it is Chile, half of it is Argentina. And we knew that once we got to Argentina, there was going to be extreme weather conditions. We heard that the wind was going to be so strong that it was going to push us off the bike constantly. So sure enough, as soon as we crossed to Argentina, the, the wind was incredible. But luckily, it was in our back, so we were cycling around 100 miles every four hours. But a couple of days into it, the highway starts turning a little bit. And now suddenly, the wind is in our side, and it's pushing us constantly off the bike. And we have to ride in a 45-degree angle so we can stay in the bike. The next day, the highway starts turning a little bit more, and now we're battling the wind against us. And that day is the windiest day in the, in the season. And it's 80 mile per hour wind against us. It's this invisible massive force pushing you constantly. And we're cycling as hard as we can and we can barely move. We can move like five miles every five hours. And the wind is so strong that everything in me is shaking. The wind is so loud that my ears hurt. It's so cold that my skin is burning. And we go through this for five hours, and we're so exhausted. I can barely focus my eyes. And at that point, I start getting really, really frustrated. And so the way I tackle these situations, the way I, I fight back, I get angry. And I get really, really, really angry. And I start imagining myself that I am a lion. I start imagining myself that I'm a lion, that I'm strong that there's this massive force within me that is unstoppable and it's raw. And it keeps building 
and building and building and building. And the only way that I know how to release it is if I roar. Roar! But the wind is way more powerful than I am, way more powerful than me. So I get really scared and I get terrified because I've never, ever in my life experienced this. And after that, I get hopeless. And I start, I start asking God to stop, to, to please make it stop because I can't take it anymore. But he doesn't stop, and neither do I. So the last thing that I do is start imagining myself that I'm not there. I start imagining myself that I'm somewhere comfortable. I'm starting imagining myself that I'm not cold, that I'm not hungry. But then I say, no, be present, be here, love the pain, embrace this, accept who, where you are. Because when you do that, when you just, when you don't fight it, when you're not terrified about it, when you don't feel hopeless, when you don't want to be somewhere else, when you're present and accept what's happening, you take control of your life. And you realize that pain is just temporary. And you have the choice to let pain either push you down or push you forward. A, a week later, we finally make it into the destination. 21 months after we left, we cycled the entire world. Uh, two years before that, I didn't think I was going to be able to walk across Spain. Two years before that, I didn't think I was going to be able to walk across campus. So I can tell you for experience that the impossible is attainable. So we get to the edge of the world. We dunk our bicycles to the ocean. We do a group hug. We settle in, and it's beautiful. I'm never going to forget that moment. But right there, right there, I realized that it was not about that moment, but about everything that I learned along the way. When I learned that I needed to accept where my journey starts, where I learned that you need to, your goal, you need to be aware of your sacrifices and accept the consequences. When I learned that you need to focus on yourself, on your path, and taking one step at a time. When I learned that you need to love yourself for who you are. When I was so broken that I learned that you need to focus on your strengths, you're not on your weaknesses. Focus on your goals, not on your obstacles. When I battled the wind, that I, that I learned that you need to learn, learn to love your pain. So today I want to encourage you to make your life about the journey, make your life about the everyday. And I want to challenge you to love your struggle, to love your doubt, to love your hesitation. I want to challenge you to love your pain. Bruce Lee once said that you should not pray for an easy life, but you should pray for the strength to endure a difficult one. Thank you. So...